Bradley for that kind introduction. I wish you were here with us. But he is attending a conference for um, college administrators across the uh, nation. And he serves in a leadership capacity there, so he's not able to be with us. So now let me introduce myself, and then I'll turn it over to our moderator, not our moderator, our MC and the host for the evening. I am State, State Senator Rhonda Fields, and I support and represent Senate District 29. Woo! You are in the heart of Senate District 29 right now, right here. The Aurora Community College is in Senate District 29. And the district starts at Colfax and Yosemite, which is the urban part. It goes east, past Buckley, all the way to Watkins, Strasburg, Bennett, and Byers. Wow. Then it goes south, out to Southland. And then it curves around where Florida comes all the way down past the, um, the municipal building over here on Chambers and Alameda, all the way down to the Havana Motor Mile, where you have all those car dealerships back and around Laurie Park to Colfax and Yosemite. I've been serving for 11 years. And what I enjoy about my job is I get to serve this community. And I get to represent the zip codes that are responsible or that are housed into Senate District 29. I don't know about you, but I've been bombarded with so many um, sad stories as we hear about what's going on across our country. But today is not about sad news. <laughs> Today is about voter engagement. Today is about voter empowerment. Because we get an opportunity to hear from these candidates who are running for the top attorney general, the, the legal advisor for the governor and for all the agencies that they represent. And so this is about us having an opportunity to engage them. I can tell you, when we sent out the notification to submit your question, we received over 52 questions. And some of them are still coming in. But we had to stop at some point. And so the candidates are aware of the categories, but not the questions. We're going to get this show on the road. But before I do that, I want to introduce our MC and our host. Let me tell you about this um, talented journalist and, um, and media expert. And he is an award-winning debate producer. And he has three Emmys. I, I wanted him to bring them so you guys could touch him and see them. <laughs> I have seen them on Zoom, but he um, uh, didn't have them for me to showcase for you today, but he'll tell you all about it. But he is a media an analyst, and his role today is to keep us on track. Because with that many questions, we've been able to narrow it down. We want to make sure that we get through all the questions, because we don't want to leave any question on the floor. But the questions came from you. And we have two talented moderators who will be introduced to you shortly who will ask those questions. And you guys will be timed. And then you'll respond. And then it's in your hands. So Dominic, please join us. Thank you very much. It's uh, absolutely my pleasure to be a part of this event tonight. I want to thank Senator Rhonda Fields and everybody associated with the Community College of Aurora that made this possible. Uh, as the Senator kindly said, I'm here to keep us on track and I intend to do so. So let me first of all introduce uh, the wonderful uh, moderators who will be asking questions uh, for our debate tonight. Now uh, uh, first of all we have Whitney Trailer. He is a legal analyst with Nine News and an attorney in Denver. Maisha Fields. Maisha Fields. I do not need an introduction in a room like this, but she, of course, is the Director of uh, Community Partnerships at Salud Family Health Centers. She's a licensed nurse practitioner and public health strategist. They'll be asking the questions tonight. And, of course, I want to introduce our candidates who are kind of to join us today. I first of all want to uh, introduce Phil Weiser, the current Attorney General of Colorado. And I can introduce John Kellner, the current District Attorney of the 18th Judicial District. Well, that brings me to a very good reminder. So I am gratified that so many 
many people are joining us both here in person and online. But I will ask you just one more time to thank both our candidates because then we will remain silent for the rest of the debate so that we can pay our respect for what they have to say because we're all here to hear what they have to say, not to each other. As interesting as some of you may very well be, we're here to listen to them. So please, one more time, help me uh, welcome both of our candidates. <laughs> What I can tell you here is just a, some of the basic ground rules. We're gonna have some opening and closing statements, the order of which was determined via coin flip before the event. We'll also have five different categories of questions asked by our moderators. And uh, after that, I will be then taking care of timing. Uh, being a forum, we're not gonna have the candidates asking questions back and forth, but if there's a need for uh, rebuttal, uh, I'll help manage that, making sure that we have equal time offered to both our candidates. Uh, a, a quick reminder that uh, this race uh, will be decided by all of you on November 8th. That is an important date for all of us to remember. Uh, these are two of the three candidates on the official ballot. There's the Libertarian candidate on the ballot, William Robinson. Uh, the invitation was not uh, processed with the time through the Libertarian Party, so these are the candidates joining us for this forum. So, without any further ado, let's get to it. We have, as we mentioned, Senator Fields uh, over 50 questions brought in by the community. We will not be getting to 50 questions tonight. We only have the room to 7.30 and we will not be going late. Uh, but we will get straight into our opening statements via the coin flip uh, before the program. Uh, Mr. Kilner will be offering the first three minute opening statement. Mr. Kilner, the floor is yours. All right, uh, I feel like I should ask this first. Can I stray from the podium? As long as the microphone's close so everyone online can hear you. Just can you hear me in the back? All right, great. Kind of? How about now? Yeah. All right. I don't think it's on. I don't think it's on. It's not on. It's, not it's, on. On. it's on. It says it's on. It's on. It's on. We'll, we'll, we'll adjust volume as the meeting goes on. Yeah. All right. Well, first things first, I just want to say once again thank you to the Community College of Aurora for hosting this debate, or forum, I should say, and particularly thank you to Senator Rhonda Fields. Uh, she reached out to me and said, would you be willing to do this? And I know there are a lot of candidates out there from both sides of the aisle who are not really willing to get together and talk about what their positions are and let you all see and hear the differences between the candidates. So, Senator Fields, we've been in a bunch of fights on criminal justice before, and you've always been a strong advocate for victims. Thank you so much for hosting this tonight. I'd like to give Senator Fields another big round. Of Great to see our Chief of Police, Dan Oates, back in action. Thank you for being here. Trying to hide out in the back. It's also great to see some of our amazing City Council people from uh, Aurora here in attendance tonight. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is John Kellner. I'm the Republican candidate for Attorney General. I feel like I should tell you a little about who I am and, and how I ended up here tonight. Uh, I grew up in a military family. My father served on active duty in the Marine Corps for about 28 years. So we bounced around the country and overseas and kind of back again. And as a young person, I really got to appreciate what we have in this great country of ours. But as a young man in college, I was going to college in Florida, don't hold it against me, and uh, you know, I saw the towers fall. I remember 9-11 very vividly. And I knew it was my time to serve as well. And so I became a second lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps when I graduated. And the Marine Corps said, you know what would be great for you, young man? Law school. And I got to go to CU Boulder. And I had this amazing opportunity there. And frankly, life-changing. I met my now wife on day one of law school. We've got two great kids, eight and 10 years old, that go to public school in our community. I spent five years on active duty in the Marine Corps as a judge advocate doing all kinds of different legal work, a lot of it as a prosecutor. And when I was getting back from Afghanistan in late 2010, I was wondering what am I gonna do when I transition to civilian life? And I knew I wanted to continue to serve, and I wanted to be a prosecutor. I wanted to seek justice for victims, and that's what I did. I joined the Boulder DA's office, and later joined the 18th Judicial District in 2013 on day one of George Brockler's administration. And as somebody who's worked in this community in the 18th Judicial District, I am passionate about seeking justice for victims in this community. Because the 18th Judicial District, you guys know, it covers Arapahoe, Douglas, Elbert, and Lincoln. It's over 1.1 million Coloradans that I am now responsible as the DA for seeking justice for them. I have fought in the courtroom, day in and day out, for victims of crime 
in Aurora who've suffered from gun violence and gang violence and drugs. And when I had the opportunity to be honored to be the district attorney, to be elected to this post, I looked around and I want to solve the crime problems that we're facing. And it became very clear to me that it is not something that can be done simply in our judicial district. That so many of the causes of the crime wave that we're dealing with are brought on by statewide laws and policies, many of which my opponent has backed along the way. And as I, as district attorney, if you need me to wrap up, that's great. Three minutes goes by really fast when you're a lawyer. <laughs> Yeah. I am committed to seeking justice for everyone. I am committed to seeing our state turn the tide on this crime wave, and that is why I am running for Attorney General. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Weiser, your, the floor is yours for three minutes. Thank you very much, and let me join thanking the great Senator Rhonda Fields. Appreciate you, Rhonda. <laughs> You too, Maisha, you guys I know are a great team. And the team of leaders here in Aurora mean a lot to me. I come to you here as a first generation American, like a lot of people in Aurora. And I recognize this nation's opportunity, a commitment to freedom and opportunity for all, allowing me to serve as a law clerk to Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, <coughs> advisor of Barack Obama in the White House. Of living the American dream. And I have great respect for people like John who served in the military because the U.S. Army liberated my mom and my grandmother after they survived the Holocaust. And they came to this nation and were welcomed. And that's what I want from Colorado, from the United States of America. And when I look around, there's a lot of work to do. In our office, as your Attorney General, I'm committed to that work. Just last week, I announced a verdict of 18 years from someone who was preying on Asian business owners who were seeking to live that American dream in Fort Collins, stealing from them during the day. The week before that, I was in the San Luis Valley, standing up for victims, enforcing for the first time ever the Victims' Rights Act. And we're now protecting victims and working to get that office on sound foot. And as I stand here in Aurora, and I think about victims, I think about gun violence, and many who've been touched. And I think the work that so many have done, Moms Demand Action, Senator Fields and others, fighting for common sense gun laws, like a large magazine capacity ban now being challenged in the courts, like a red flag law that many of us fought for, I'm committed to that work and will remain all in. The opioid epidemic is another cause of too many losses. People are dying every day on wait lists for drug treatment. So as Attorney General, I've taken action, and I've now brought back over $500 million to Colorado, working with folks like your Commissioner Nancy Jackson in a bottom-up solution to provide more drug treatment, recovery, education, prevent services to save lives. And when I think about the work to defend consumers, we're just getting started. And we've already got $85 million back taking on country, companies like CenturyLink, who promised people a price lock guarantee, but then raised prices. Next question, do you believe in the science of climate change for climate change? <laughs> Mr. Weiser. Yes. Yes. In Biden versus Texas, the court cleared the way of the Biden administration to end a Trump-era immigration program that forces asylum seekers arriving at the southwest border to wait, await approval in Mexico. Do you believe asylum seekers should await approval in Mexico? Yes. Mr. Wood. The question is, can we make sure asylum, which is a right, is respected? If we can do that in Mexico, that's clearly better. But the key thing is, we can't undermine this legal right to asylum. Mr. Weiser, and I agree with that. Uh, you can't undermine that legal right. And you know, as a Marine reservist, just last year I went to Virginia and helped run an Afghan refugee camp for about 35 days because I truly believe that one of the greatest things about our country is that we welcome people legally here. Next 
next question. Do you believe excluding state funds from being used at a religious school is a valid separation of church and state? This was not a hypothetical for me. This case came to the Supreme Court. Uh, the so-called Blaine Amendment issue in Colorado was the policy. And the concern that I have, if we take public monies out of public schools in private parochial schools, we can undermine public education, which is why I was on the side of protecting our Blaine Amendment. You know, the legislature or local government is going to give parents real true school choice and you know, allow them, let's say, with vouchers to go send their kid to a school that they want. It shouldn't be restricted to one that is a secular school. They should truly have the choice. Yep. So the, um, the question was, is that a valid, uh, is that a separation of church and state then, if it is a religious school and the public dollars are being given? Yeah, what I'm saying is that when they engage in, in giving that sort of money out, then I don't think you can you know, claim that as some sort of violation of the separation. Let's get to our last uh, lecture question. Last question. Do you believe the OSHA vaccination and testing mandate for COVID is lawful? Mr. Weiser. So just to be clear, uh, it's been struck down, I believe. It's no longer in effect. I don't even know if it's being appealed. Um, I was concerned on it, looking at it at the time. Ultimately, I didn't take a public position on it. So. Um, I haven't taken this in either way. I wasn't involved in litigation. Um, we don't have a state OSHA to do our own work on it, and I didn't have an ability to get convinced enough one way or the other, so um, we were out of that litigation. It, it was struck down, and I think it was appropriately struck down because OSHA did not have that legal authority to dictate whether or not you know, somebody who owns a business, let's say over 100 people, needs to have a vaccine mandate. And that's irrespective of what people think about the vaccine itself. The question ultimately is, does the federal government have the authority to reach into the state of Colorado and tell individuals what to do? I think the answer with OSHA was no. So uh, one of the things you get to do when you have the opportunity to bring together great uh, community forum like this and your uh, State Senator Fields is you get a chance to represent the community, but also she's seen every question come through. I want to give you, Senator Fields, a chance for the last question of the evening before we get to closing statements. Thank you, um, Dominic, for... I need to stand I can't up. hear you. Who's come to this mic, please. <laughs> awesome job. I'm so glad you're here facilitating this conversation. Thank you guys both for being here and the moderators as well. Um, my question is really based on what I didn't hear and what I need more clarification on. And the question is about healing, racial healing. There was some discussion about policing in reference to, you know, no one should be discriminated against, no one should be using excessive force, we shouldn't see black bodies because they're walking or because they're driving. But what I see are these repeated images where hatred seems to be on the increase. So my question is about, you know, yeah, we, we like the police. We need the police. I call them when I am in trouble. I use 911 when I need to. But my question is, how do we hold law enforcement accountable for their lack of judgment when we see that excessive force was not warranted, in my view, but it was exercised. And we don't see it just happening here in Colorado. We see it happening across the state. And so as you all running for a district attorney, I want you to speak to discrimination. I want you to speak about hate that we're seeing on the increase because what I'm seeing is that black people and brown people and gay people are under attack because of the color of their skin or because of their gender or maybe because of who they love. 
And it can't be, well, you know, I like the police. I know we have bad apples, but I want to know what your office can do. And I heard training, I know. We know that you're not trained to, to handcuff babies when they're trying to get their nails done. We know that they're not trained to do that. But we're seeing these outrageous behavior that's demonstrated by law enforcement or by someone who just wants to use a gun in an inappropriate way and they want to harm people just for shopping or going to church. I know. <laughs> because this is important to me. Because I'm a grandmother. And I don't want to continue to have these conversations with, you know, my kids about how to drive because they're fearful when the police pulls them over. So there has to be a conversation about racial healing. And for those of you who want me to move it along, it's because I'm black. You keep going. <laughs> and I don't get pulled over, I get pulled over. But you might not. And your sense of fear is not the same. So I need you to respond to that long-winded question about racial healing, discrimination, equity, gender equality, and people who are just plain, just different as it relates to overseeing our state to make sure that we all can live a life with dignity and respect without having to be confronted with your black. And you can't get a job, you can't get housing. We can't get health care. Mr. Kelner, I'm going to throw it to you first. I really appreciate that from you, Senator Fields. One of the things you mentioned early on there was hatred on the rise, on the increase. Last year, when we were seeing an increase in hate crimes across our communities, across Colorado, it was frankly skyrocketing in a terrible kind of way. I went to you, Senator Fields, and ask you if we can work together. I'm trying to sponsor a bill, you sponsored it, and then I testified for it, to update our hate crime statute to make sure we can truly hold people accountable who commit those vile offenses. I went to the Capitol with you, testified multiple times, and you were able to get that across the finish line. It was signed into law, had the ceremony here with Governor Polis in Florida, and that was a victory, that was an important first step. Other things that I've done since then, recognizing that this continues to be a problem, is start a hate crimes unit within my own office to go after the people who commit these offenses and hold them accountable. And we've been successful in doing that. When it comes to training, and I, I do understand the frustration with that answer, but truly so much has to do with appropriate peace officer standards and training. That is a position that post board peace officer standards and training that is headed up by the Attorney General. And it is incumbent on the Attorney General to provide clear guidance about what those standards and training expectations are so that we can hold people to a standard, so that we can hold them accountable even if they have a badge. And I recognize as well, to your, your point, about you know, what does it mean now post dobs for other people that are maybe concerned about what's gonna happen with other rights that they have come to enjoy and expect. And I understand how that has turned some people, um, it's made them very confused and fearful about what the future may hold. So I wanna be very, very clear to everybody here that I support the right of people to marry who they love with no conditions there. And I will fight to uphold that very important right as well. Mr. Weiser, can I just make this my closing statement? Is that okay? Well, I, no, we're going to actually have a closing statement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I can't close on a better note. Because it just got real. And thank you.
always be real. The last campaign, I was at an event in Denver in October, and one of your colleagues, Senator James Coleman, said, it's nice you're here, I was at a church, trying to get people out to vote. Be better if you were here as Attorney General. So I've worked hard recently at your church and other churches to show up in community. First thing we need to do is show up everywhere. I've been to every county in Colorado as a candidate and against Attorney General. If any of you have more invitations to different churches, let me know. I've been endorsed by the Ministerial Alliance because I asked them, hey, it's time for another conversation. Because showing up and listening is the basis of building trust. And when this issue came up, about racial inequities in policing and what we do, we got a law passed that gave our office tools, and I didn't just fight for those tools, I used those tools. And we put together an unbelievable team. We got more free pro bono services than the Attorney General's office has ever gotten to do work that was nationwide quality, so when the Department of Justice looked at it, they said, we couldn't do any better, you got this. And the city of Aurora read the report and the people of Aurora can read this report because transparency is critical to trust. We also worked on another report, people who were subject to clergy abuse, and we brought transparency to honor victims. We're committed to making sure that nobody is preyed on, and what I loved about your statement is hate jumps a track. That shooter in Buffalo, you know what he said in his manifesto? We'll get the Jews next. There was an attack on a synagogue in San Diego. You know what it was inspired by? An attack on a mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand. And when the mosque here in Aurora had a mourning, the Jewish community showed up and said, we stand with our Muslim brothers and sisters. Yeah. Yeah. We all must stand together against hate. Because hate against any one of us is hate against all of us. My family's history is one of surviving the worst hate we've seen in the 20th century. And hate is on the rise. And demonization is on the rise. People saying someone's not worthy of being respected as a human being. We are all fellow citizens. We all need to recognize our fellow humanity, whether we're police officers, or teachers or nurses or whoever. And we've got work to do on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I set up a diversity, equity, inclusion impact team in our office and have 80 people involved. And you look at our leadership team, more women and close to one third diverse individuals. And I pledge to you, I will keep that work going. I fought for another law in law enforcement. If a law enforcement officer lies, is untruthful, they can be decertified because they're not worthy of the profession. I've got more work to do on this, and I probably used up my time for closing too. Thank you, everybody. And you've done a remarkable segue, remarkable debate. We do have some closing statements. We want to give the opportunities for candidates to speak one last time. Again, we uh, determine this order via coin flip before the event. Uh, Mr. White. By violating the Victims' Rights Act. We need that law here in Aurora. And we wrote a report about the state of policing. The city of Aurora then had a choice. They could read the report and say, we've got some work to do. We need to improve trust in law enforcement. Or they could say, you got the facts wrong. We'll see you in court. They chose to work with us. And I know we've got the police chief here today who embodies that spirit of continuous improvement. How do we rebuild the trust of the community through transparency, through improved training, through better recruitment, so we can continue to ask, how do we not leave people feeling vulnerable as citizens because of their skin color? That's work we all have to play a part in. As the Attorney General, I'm leading for the first time in 40 years an effort to redesign how we train peace officers in our state. And we're gonna start by asking what core skills do people need like empathy 
an emotional awareness, so encounters that sometimes get escalated but shouldn't, don't get escalated. And I think about a conversation I had with a police chief who said they had one of their worst officer-involved shootings, and it was after an officer was at a child abuse situation, and a child was really harmed, and went right to another call and used excessive force, and that officer's not on the force. So we're not supporting officers well when we don't give them the tools to be successful. We need transparency, we need accountability, build trust among all communities, particularly people of color. I'm committed to that work. Mr. Kilmer, and nobody should ever be discriminated against because of the color of their skin, and certainly not by law enforcement. You know, one of my jobs as DA has been to try to rebuild some of that lost trust, both with police and with prosecutors. And we've made a lot of strides in that regard. We've worked very hard in that way. One thing that I can tell you is that we hold accountable officers who break the law. In my office right now, there's an allegation against an officer who used excessive force and pistol whipped a man. And we are prosecuting that case to the fullest extent of the law. When you look at the broad scope, though, I want to be really clear about this. You know, July 19th into the 20th, I was here for the midnight vigil, where we were remembering those who were lost in the Aurora Theater shooting. Twelve people, 70 others, shot. And as we gathered to remember them, the Aurora Police Department, played a huge role in that. They played for everybody to hear the radio traffic from that night, and it's heartbreaking. And then the survivors, the victims, their family members lined up by the street and applauded as the Oral Police Department drove by to show their thanks and their gratitude for their her heroism that night. That's the Aurora Police Department that I know and respect. And so, what I want to be really clear about is there are a couple bad apples out there, and we weed them out. But writ large, I think police in Colorado do a dangerous and difficult job, and they do it to the very best of their abilities. We do need to hold people accountable when they break the law. But I want to be really clear that I support the police here and the valuable work they do. Thank you, Mr. Keller. Let's get to our next question. And this will be for Mr. Kellner. So, so what role do you see local law enforcement agency, agencies playing in the enforcement of immigration law, and particularly regarding the sharing of information and resources with the immigration custody enforcement? First part about that, it's really important to understand that we don't want the federal government basically co-opting local law enforcement and telling them what to do. I do think it is very important, especially as we tackle this fentanyl crisis, and you know, many of the individuals associated with these drug trafficking organizations that we have indicted or pled guilty over time, many of them have come from across the southern border and come to our country illegally, and it's very important that law enforcement have the ability to work with our federal partners and share information when appropriate so that we can actually make a dent in what I see as one of the greatest crises facing our community right now when it comes to fentanyl. Mr. Weiser. I faced this question and I took action. There were efforts by the Trump administration to coerce local governments to do what you talked about, to be commandeered by immigration enforcement and to be forced to engage in immigration enforcement. I brought a lawsuit under the 10th Amendment challenging that commandeering of state resources and the holding back of money that was illegal, and I won. And I got communities their law enforcement grants, and they didn't have to be commandeered to do immigration enforcement, which is the federal government's job. Thank you very much. Let's, uh, I think we're uh, due for our next uh, topic of questions, category of questions, rather, to our moderators. <coughs> 
So the EPA and state officials have been focusing tightly on oil and gas operations, particularly in Well County. There was a settlement with DCP, which included a fine of $3.25 million. Um, last year, the EPA, I think, along with the state, settled with Noble Energy for a million dollars. Last month, however, West Elk sued the state for not acting on its pollution permit timely under the Clean Air Act. That lawsuit was just filed. So there's obviously a lot of litigation going on in Welk County. There's allegations that the permits are not being reviewed timely. So the question is, is Welk County being picked on? And why the delay in issuing these emission permits? Mr. Roy. The matter you refer to under active litigation represented by my office is not one I can comment on. I will talk more broadly about our work to protect public health, to protect air quality. Colorado has a tradition of working together to solve problems. That tradition is forged in how we manage our water in a way that works for everyone. Under John Hickenlooper's term as governor, he brought to the table environmentalists, the oil and gas industry, and said methane emissions are substantially more harmful to human health than even carbon dioxide. We got to do something about all the methane emissions from oil and gas operations. Colorado set the national standard. That standard was adopted by the EPA. And then the Trump administration tried to repeal that methane rule and I and our office fought to keep it in place. And we'll keep fighting to protect our air quality. And if someone pollutes our air quality and violates the rules, we will go after them. And we'll make sure we create those rules the right way through collaborative problem solving. Mr. Killen, I don't know about you all, uh, but I moved to Colorado because of the beauty it has to offer. You know, I remember very vividly uh, coming here uh, right from the airport, heading to Boulder for the very first time, kind of cresting over the hill and seeing the foothills and thinking, wow, this is a pretty special place. You know, every weekend in the winter, we are skiing. Almost every weekend when I'm not campaigning now, uh, we would be out hiking. And so I want everybody to know that under an Attorney General, John Kellner, you can count on me to protect our air and our water and our beautiful natural resources. But the question asked was about Weld County and whether or not they might be being picked on. And what we've seen, and frankly continue to feel in terms of that pain at the gas pump, when you are wondering how, to, how in the world did I just spend 100 bucks to fill up my gas tank, is that we do have these you know, rules in Colorado that if they would just simply act on their permits, could produce clean and reliable energy to help relieve some of that pain and some of the inflation that we're feeling. But you have a hostile administration to even giving an opportunity for producers in Weld County to, de to develop their oil and gas resources, and that's frankly wrong. Let's get to our next question in this category. Thank you. This category is, what is the vision for Colorado? Last question in this category is, what are the top three challenges facing Coloradans, and what can you do as the next Attorney General to address these issues? Mr. Kilmer. Number one is crime. You know, crime is crushing Coloradans. I think you heard it before, you'll hear it again. You know, we're number one in the country. We're the capital of the country when it comes to motor vehicle theft. That's unacceptable. We have people dying from fentanyl. We're getting this poison and losing their lives, and it's increasingly younger and younger people. And I talk to those parents who've lost their kids, and I know that we need to do more to hold those poison peddlers accountable. And it is soft on crime policies and laws that have been signed into law by Governor Polis and many times championed by people like Bill Weiser that have led us to where we are when it comes to crime. Other issues that we've got to deal with, our water crisis. And there's no question 
that we are in a 20 year drought and water is life in Colorado. And the water that flows out of Colorado provides jobs and life to some 40 million people downriver. We are gonna be faced with some tremendous challenges over the coming years as people call on us to renegotiate the Colorado River Compact. And as we have to deal with less and less water to go around, we need innovative and bold visions when it comes for new water projects, things where we can store water and ensure that we take this very finite resource and make it possible to continue to grow in Colorado. I feel like I'm taking up too much time now. You're okay? We'll, uh, we'll call that good for that question. And uh, you go to Mr. Weiser for your answer. Thank you, Maisha, for a good way to help us start to bring together some different strands. Gun violence deaths are up, again, at an alarming rate. The challenge around gun violence is one that we must commit to. And as we think about this community a decade later, and I was there in a meaningful commemoration and acknowledgement of the pains and losses felt. I think about the large <laughs> magazine capacity ban that came directly from that night with an eye to saving lives. With the Bruin decision from the Supreme Court, there's now a gun lobby challenge to the large magazine capacity ban. I believe in that ban, I support it, I'll fight any effort to repeal it, and I'll defend it in court. I talked about our work on the red flag law, which is a powerful tool, and we've got to work hard to use more effectively. I haven't mentioned our work on safe gun storage, because when you talk about gun violence deaths, we lose even more people to suicide than homicide, and we have to do better in storing weapons safely. We have a mental health crisis. We have a substance abuse crisis in our nation. What underlies that is a connection crisis. How can we be there to support one another? Our office runs Safe to Tell. It was set up after Columbine to address gun violence, but the number one threat we get is the threat of suicide by young people. As a parent to teenagers, that's personal to me, and I'm committed to protecting young people from threats on social media, or investigating Facebook and TikTok, protecting people from those pushing vaping products like Juul, and protecting young people in our communities, and obviously keeping dangerous drugs away from young people, getting the word out is high on our agenda. But finally, I worry about our democracy crisis emanating from Washington, D.C. We've seen attacks on voting rights, and we need a John Lewis Voting Rights Act to address two terrible Supreme Court decisions that are undermining voting rights. We need to take seriously right now that there's not just January 6th in the past, but January 6th in the present. Because in this judicial district, people have called for violence against elected officials. People are afraid to be election judges. And finally, the demonization in our rhetoric. Attacks on social media is polluting our politics. So what can I do as Attorney General? I can be a champion for people. I can work hard to be my best authentic self and to be a servant, a servant leader and a public servant. Thank you, Mr. Weiser. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the, the good news here is we are in the home stretch. We have uh, another section of questions we have for moderators, more of a lightning round. So I'll ask for candidates. We're asking for very short answers here, something that would fit on a bumper sticker. I'll throw up to our moderators. <laughs> a average bumper sticker. Bumper sticker. <laughs> uh, average bumper sticker. So I'll throw up to our moderators to uh, start our lightning round. So this is directed at you, Mr. Weiser. And some of these will require a little more uh, explanation, others not. So this first one, do you believe the 2020 election between Mr. Biden and Mr. Trump was stolen? No. No. Do you By the way, we can celebrate having two candidates who accept that reality. Yeah. <laughs> weapons ban and a ghost weapons ban? Yes. No and yes. Do you support a woman's right to choose over her reproductive rights? 
Yes, the Dobbs decision was wrongly decided. I don't think I can give you a bumper sticker answer for this. Oh, yeah. It's just simply, I think like most Americans, too nuanced of a position to be able to tell you a yes or no answer to that. No, it's not. Uh, I'll go on if you want. Let, let, it's a lightning round. Let's, let's move forward. We have an answer. Uh, moderators, your next question. <clears throat> next question, two-part question. What is your favorite thing about public life? What do you miss most about <laughs> private life? <laughs> I like this question. First question. That's you, Mr. Roy. Like so there you go. I love the fact that I get to meet people who bring to me challenges they're facing. And I get to work with other public servants to solve problems and make their lives better. And what I miss about private life is I don't have as much free time as I used to. Mr. Keller. Yeah, I love getting around the state and meeting new people and seeing everything that our state truly has to offer and getting to understand you know, what the issues are across the state that are affecting different constituencies from that rural to urban divide and then how we can work together to solve those problems. And the thing I miss the most, uh, private life is probably everything, but truthfully, uh, more time with my kids.